Good morning, everyone. Now, they've made it a little difficult on me this morning because I've got a handheld, and then I've got things to read, so bear with me. We're going to start off uh, this morning with a uh, thank you card. This is from the Smock family. Our family would like to send a special thank you to everyone who helped with the lunch uh, following Dad's funeral. It was delicious and served with love. Thanks, the James T. Smock family. Uh, so just our prayers with the Smock family. For announcements. All right, here we go. Um, we hope this room is full next week, and we've got to struggle about finding where we're going to put everybody. So make sure you encourage your family and friends to come and uh, gather and celebrate the resurrection of our Savior and King. However, with more in attendance, that does bring some unique opportunities. Um, who wants to park in the back gravel? Anybody? I parked back there today. But uh, what we'd like for you to do, if you're able and willing, please pull clear back as far as you can in the gravel. We're going to open up the docks doors, and you'll be able to come in through the docks and into the commons. That way, for a lot of the visitors that don't know about that, you know, as they park in the front or the side, uh, then they've got a parking spot to get in here. Um, uh, let's see. This Thursday, the 28th, so Thursday night, uh, we're showing The Passion of the Christ at 6.30. This is a very realistic movie and not appropriate for all ages. Um, child care, um, make sure I read that right, movie and not appropriate for all ages. Child care is not provided, though. Um, then for next weekend, or the following weekend, Faith Promise, April 6th and 7th, uh, we're kicking off on Saturday uh, with the Daughters of the King T uh, at 10 a.m. in the Commons. This is not just a mother and daughter's event. It is for the ladies of all ages. Invite your friends. Uh, please bring a finger food to share. If you have a pretty teapot, uh, bring it for your table. Uh, various teas and fruit punches will be provided. There will be a short presentation from our guest speakers, uh, Lena George and Lori Edson of Gyra Missions. Um, Crossroads families support several children in India with Gyra. Okay, then, and that's on Saturday. So I encourage you ladies, uh, that's going to be a great uh, morning to fellowship and enjoy that. But then on Sunday, two weeks from today, don't be mad at me, but we canceled donuts. Oh, <gasps> why? <laughs> well, we pancakes and sausage. So when you guys get out of church on April 7th, well, you will be smelling all the sausage as you walk in that morning. We're doing pancakes and sausage for everyone, uh, and it's for our Faith Promise Weekend. And today, you notice you got the booklet. We didn't pass out our pledge cards for Faith Promise, but if you would, spend the next two weeks I'm trying to get Jimmy, thanks for my hand here. Spend the next two weeks. I want you to read everything that's in this booklet. A lot of, lot of thought, prayers with the different missions that we serve uh, and join along with. And at the very back of it, it talks about our pledge cards that we'll pass out in two weeks. So in two weeks, uh, when you get done, don't plan on going out to brunch after church or going out for lunch because we're going to have more pancakes and sausage than what we know what to do with. And uh, hopefully you'll stick around and enjoy the time of fellowship with that. Um, I'll turn it over to Tegan. Would you stand as we join together in worship? salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession, I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion, by his blood I have been set free, I believe in the 
resurrection. Hallelujah, his life is destined to be. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be. In Jesus' mighty name, I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe in the hope of heaven. He's preparing a place for me. Far beyond what hearts imagine, ears have heard or eyes have seen. I believe that day is coming. He's returning to claim his bride. Light the altar, keep it burning. See the Lamb who rose the roaring light. All oh, praise to God the Father. All oh, praise to Christ the Son. All oh, praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? No one ever be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? No one ever be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? All oh, praise to God the Father. All oh, praise to Christ the Son. All oh, praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was in this endeavor. All oh, praise to God the Father, all oh, praise to Christ the Son, all oh, praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be, in Jesus' mighty name I believe.
that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so Of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire, and in darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now, I give you Will I have the strength? 
strength to try. You're the first, you're the last, you're forever. You're the one who brings spring out of winter. You're the promise and you are the keeper. You're the one who holds all things together. In my grieving, in my sorrow, will your goodness steady when I'm blinded? You're forever. You're the one who brings spring out of winter. You're the promise and you are the keeper. You're the one who holds all things together. You're the first, you're the last, you're forever. You're the one who brings spring out of winter. You're the promise. Together, together. 
together. You're the one who holds all things together. At this time, you're welcome to go get communion from the tables and return to your seats for a time of reflection. Well, good morning, church. It's Sunday. It's Palm Sunday. Um, my name is Jeff Brown. I am a sinner saved by grace and an elder here at uh, Crossroads. I was thinking as I was as I, as I was coming up here. Do you remember doing uh, doing term papers and the dread that used to fill you with? <laughs> uh, s- several of you are in the uh, education field and. Uh, I don't know. I, I'd imagine for teachers, it's probably just a dread as much to degrade those, all those papers as it is to, as it fear, fills you with fear to write the paper. But anyway, I remember being in seventh grade. My first term paper was Samuel Adams, the story of Samuel Adams. And uh, with the uh, help of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, which we weren't supposed to use, and uh, my head knowledge, because I'm a lover of history and once called by Brian Carpenter a history geek um, from this very pulpit, from the stage, he called me a history geek because I corrected him on Thomas Jeff. He said that Roosevelt sent Lewis and Clark out on, a, on, the, uh, on the, the mission to search out what was uh, the Louisiana Purchase. And that, I said, no, that was Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> And, but yeah, it, uh, anyway, a lover of history, uh, always have been. Uh, term papers, like I was getting back to, usually start off with a statement or a thesis question. And that's where I'm at today. Uh, Matthew 16, 13 through 17, Jesus, if you will, has convened the class. He's got the disciples with him. And the first question, somewhat simple, he looks at him and he goes, who do men say that I am? What does is, what is society say? And what are you hearing about me on the streets? And there, you know, that, that was probably kind of the easier question because, he, you know, he gets a few answers. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist coming back you know, or one of the prophets of old. Okay, so he, I could see him nodding his head in agreement like, okay, those are one, one answer, if you will. But then... He's already got his second question in mind, and that's the question that if there was a question, the question that you would write the whole Bible about, or, you know, if there was a question, do I qualify as a Christian? And as Palm Sunday, you know, the the people all gathered, and he was lowly and riding on a colt, which filled fulfilled prophecy, many had the wrong idea about why he was riding into Jerusalem. He was not riding in as a conquering king in the military style of King David. 
but he was a conquering king, but in a different way, not in the way they were thinking. They were not thinking as they were waving the palm branches, let's make Israel great again, because the palm is the, uh, if you will, the flag of uh, Israel at that time. No, his, his goal was something else, and it's how you answer this question. And, and I remember as Miles was preaching this last Sunday, I'm like, oh my goodness, he's about to preach my communion meditation for next week. And so I wrote this down real quick. In the end, there are only two categories, those who belong to God and those who do not, which was on a slide up here. The question that is asked, the second question that is asked in Matthew 16, 13 through 17, is who do you say that I am? That's the question that cuts to the heart. Who do you see when you see Jesus? And as I remember, as we do several baptisms up here, the confession of faith that we do, and it's, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I accept him now as my Lord and as my Savior. And that's what this time's about. This is how the conquering king that they were looking for. This conquering king defeated death. There is no more sting in death. He has been it. He died. He, was, he lived a life like all of us and died. Died a death on the cross like a criminal. Was, in, was dead for three days. But that's not where the story ends. He arose and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And in that imagery, that means it is finished. It is done. It's completed. There's no more we can add to it. So at this time, I'd like to remember his crucifixion on the cross by his sacrifice by his body that is this uh, emblem here likewise he shed his blood on the cross and this uh, blood that was shed covered all of our sins symbolized here by the Jews now let us pray dear heavenly father we thank you that we can gather here today in some parts of the world that is still considered illegal so we are happy that we can just meet here, first of all. And second of all, we are glad that we can worship, that we bring our hearts to this time, that we can be a congregation together to hear your word, to praise your glory, and let the word come forth from the message. May it prick our hearts, may it spare us to action in a society that needs to hear the good news. Be with the gift, be with the giver, the, the gifts that are given to the church that keep the church running and the missions around the world, that, that these things happen, that this, uh, this is an amazing thing that you have set forth, the whole idea of we uh, worship you in a time, in a place, and can help one another, and uh, just praise you now and give you thanks. In your name I pray, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Terry Goodwin, and I'm excited to be here to share the word with you this morning. Uh, would you guys thank Tegan and Nancy for leading us in worship today? I really appreciate all that they put into it and the practice they put in in preparation. Um, I have to tell you something. So about a month ago, Miles asked me if I would preach it on this morning. And uh, of course, I was like, absolutely, let me make sure nothing's going on and I'm clear and we're good to go. I'll, I'll preach. I'm like, no problem. I'm excited about that. He gave me what he wanted me to talk about. I'm like, great. Then, then Robbie comes to me and goes, oh, by the way, is it okay if I'm gone that Sunday morning and Miles is gone that Sunday morning? I'm like, I don't care. It doesn't change what I do. Well, the thing is, I, lo I love the relationship that I have with Miles and and Robbie, because there, there's a relationship of trust. Uh, yesterday, we had a little situation, an alarm was going off in the building, and, uh, and we just kind of figured out how to take care of it. Uh, Miles is down in Disney World, actually, and uh, he's calling to make sure that we know what to do, and his, his son-in-law Brock's with him, and, and they're just checking on things, making sure everything's smooth. The thing I love about Miles and Robbie, though, is is that they want to make sure you guys are taken care of as a church. They, they care deeply about you. 
and uh, there was an event going on in the building when the alarm was going off and the, the situation was happening. Nothing bad happened, but uh, they just wanted to make sure that everything was, was good for that group that was meeting out there. There was a shower happening in the commons, and, and they truly care for each and every one of you. So I'm thankful that they can be gone, yet even when they're gone, they still are thinking of you and caring about you. One of the things, uh, one of the things I want to share with you with them being gone, though, is I'm going to give you a confession this morning from me. A confession from me that, uh, that Miles may be surprised by, Robbie may be surprised by, but um, I realized this week I have a problem. Uh, I have a, uh, a gambling problem, okay? So uh, the, every year around this time, this happens to me because there's these opportunities to, uh, to put $5 down, and you have a chance to win who knows how much money. And, or you put $5 into a pool, and then the winner gets a, a free meal. Or you put uh, $5 into a pool, and somebody gets whatever's left of the money at the end of the time. And so for the past couple days, I've been struggling with my problem because there's been basketball on TV each and every day. Does anybody else relate to that problem? Yeah, you can be honest. They're gone. Miles and Robbie aren't here, so we can be honest about our faults this morning. No, honestly, I love basketball time. I love March Madness. Uh, This year, we've really gotten into uh, the men's tournament and the women's tournament. Um, If you have not watched this girl named Caitlin Clark play basketball uh, from Iowa, you're missing out. I've never seen anything like her. Uh, she's amazing, but uh, we, we've been watching and enjoying it. But the truth is, sometimes these loves for sports or these loves for brackets and things like that can become an addiction, all right? I, I'm not really saying I have a problem with that because, honestly, I didn't put a single dollar into any brackets this year. Most of my brackets are based on my family or people around me that want to put it together and just see who does the best, I always lose because I always believe Illinois will win. (laughs) Just the way it works. Um, Thankfully, they've won so far this week. But uh, I will tell you that many, many years ago, uh, Jeff mentioned that this is Palm Sunday. Many years ago, I got to preach on Palm Sunday at Old Union Church of Christ. And I remember this because... I was really focused on the palm branches uh, of that. And I was like, Miles, can, can we have palm branches? And he's like, well, uh, sure. So when Miles asked me to preach today, I asked the same question. Can we have palm branches? And he's like, do you really want to have palm branches? I have this vision of me walking down the aisle and you guys all fanning palm branches at me. I just thought that'd be a beautiful entrance into a message. He chose that that wasn't the best thing for us to do, so now you just get to see me here on stage. But, but I'm really glad to be here. I love this series that we've been going through uh, called, Gl- I believe it's called Glimpse. I thought it was on the screen, and now I'm questioning. Yeah, it is. I can see it. Uh, it's called Glimpse, but we're really talking about little pictures of Jesus. We're looking at Jesus and trying to understand a little bit more about him. And this morning, we're going to look at another picture of Jesus uh, involving healing, okay? And as we look at this, we're going to be looking in Mark chapter 5. So if you want to turn over to your Bibles to Mark chapter 5, we're going to read our passage of Scripture this morning. But when we look at Jesus, one of the things that I love about studying specifically Jesus in Scripture is there's so many different stories or parables or, or I would almost call them outtakes, things you can pull out and just study that little section about Jesus and learn so much. It's amazing how each place he went, each thing he did became its own story in and of itself because everything he did was so amazing. And, and when Jesus was, was teaching, people stopped and they listened. When Jesus was healing, people stopped and they watched. And when, and when Jesus went away to be by himself, people stopped and they literally waited for him to return. Be, because one of the important things to know about Jesus is he chose to go away to be with his father and to pray. And when he did that, people would literally sit and wait for his return because they could not stand the thought of leaving him. 
And uh, here in Mark chapter 5, we're, we're going to start with verse 21. But we're going to read about Jesus healing two different people this morning. Uh, so starting with verse 21, it says this. It says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. While he was by the lake, then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Isn't that a great name? Is anybody here named Jairus? If you are having a child, I think some of you are getting ready to have children, think of the name Jairus. I just think that'd be a great name for you to use for a, for a child. And then for years to come here in church, we could be like, hey, Jairus, how's it going? I, names are fun. All right. So, sorry, I get distracted sometimes. I may have taken too many meds this morning. <laughs> Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come to put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed on him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she, got wor she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her sufferings. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. My brother, the teacher, why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. When he went, he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? This child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in there and the child in there where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. You see, being named Jairus is, a, is actually a good thing because there's a good story about Jairus because there's a story of his child being healed. And this morning, as, as we study this, this passage, as we learn about the woman who is bleeding and, and Jairus' daughter, there, it's important for us to know that faith is the key to all of this. And, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But faith is the key to all of this. If you want Jesus to move or heal, then we're called to have faith. We're called to have faith. This faith is an opportunity for us to live out what we believe. It's an understanding that Jesus is who he says he is. Faith is not a spur of the moment decision, but faith is a life choice. Faith is a life choice. When you decide to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, as Jeff was talking about when, when somebody's immersed in baptism, that, that faith that you have is not something that's just there for that moment. When we have faith that Jesus is who he says he is, it's faith that lasts for eternity. It's faith that we live out each and every day. It's faith that changes our decision making. It's faith that changes everything about, about us. 
In this passage in Mark chapter 5, verse 28, it said this. It said, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. The woman had faith that with Jesus it was possible. Imagine being this woman. This story can hit close to home for some, and I know it can be kind of something we don't like to think about, but let's be honest. She had been bleeding for 12 years. She, she had been to doctors. She'd gone to the doctors and said, what can you do for me? They'd try different things. She'd pay them, and nothing got better. She was an outcast. She was left outside the city, and she was left to know that there was no hope for her because she was unclean. Yet in this moment, she realized Jesus was coming. And, and as she knew Jesus was coming, she knew that if she was to go make Jesus unclean, that would be a bad thing. But she believed. She had faith to say, if I can just touch his cloak, nobody has to know. But if I can just touch his cloak, I can be healed. My life can be changed. And, and that's the faith that she had. Do, do you expect that Jesus can heal? That's a serious question. Yeah. yeah. Jesus can heal. Jesus can. And this woman in this scripture knew that Jesus could heal. She knew that he was so powerful that if she had faith and she went to him and just touched his garment, that would change everything. You know, if you come up here and you decide that you have faith in me and you touch my garment you're going to be very disappointed, okay? I'm just telling you, there's nothing magical, nothing special about me or my clothes. But when Jesus was walking on this earth, that's the thing about him. He had the power to heal. He had the power to transform lives. And this woman understood that even from afar. I don't believe she had ever met Jesus before, but she had heard about him. She'd heard about who he was and that he was the Messiah and he was there to heal and to save. You know, it isn't about telling Jesus what to do when we talk about healing. But we should always know that it is possible. We're not telling, when we pray, we're not saying, Jesus, you will heal this person. We're saying, Jesus, I have faith that you can heal this person. Please, please, please. And you know, in my life, I used to pray timidly to Jesus. And I think I learned this at a young age. Be, because uh, there's nothing wrong with this prayer, but I was always taught to say, Jesus, if it's your will, would you do this? And I, I think that's a good thing. God, if, if it's your desire for this person to be healed and, and not pass at this time, God, please make it happen. But I'll also say it's okay for us to pray with faith that it's going to happen. And, and to say, God, please, please provide healing in this space. I know you can. Because we have a relationship with God, and as we're praying, it, it's about a conversation between us. It's about an opportunity for us to tell God how we truly to believe. And I'll tell you the truth, that in my life, I no longer feel timid with God. I no longer feel like I have to say, God, I would like this, but really, if you want, don't want it, it's okay. No. When I talk to God now, I'm like, God, this is what... I believe you want in this world. I believe there's good to come from this. God, would you make this possible? And sometimes God says yes, and sometimes he says no. But, but also when we're talking about healing, we do have to understand that healing looks different in different people. Sometimes healing happens when people get to go be with him in heaven. That's true healing as well. And our understanding of that is so uh, small compared to God's. Because God views us in the world of eternity while, while we struggle to see beyond our time here on earth. You know, I have hope for eternity in heaven with Jesus, but, but sometimes my focus is clearly just on where I am now. And, and that can be a distraction. You know, you know, when we pray, we should ask God to do what we want him to do. The other thing that I, that I see in the scripture is Jesus moves or heals in his own time. You know, he decides the right time. He decides when he's going to do something. You know, um, we, we view pictures of Jesus or we watch videos of Jesus. We're going to watch one in just a few minutes. But uh, when we watch and, and view Jesus, 
we, we a lot of times think that he was always doing exactly what everyone wanted him to do. He was almost like a, an easy button. Jesus didn't walk around and people asked for something and he said, there you go, you got it. He wasn't just handing things out, but he chose when to heal. He chose when to speak. He chose when to stop. I always wonder, like, how did they decide the perfect spot for him to stop and everybody gather around so he could preach? But he knew the perfect time because it was his timing. One of the, one of the things I, I want to note is that uh, when Jesus chose to heal the woman with bleeding, because even though she reached out and touched him, he allowed her to be healed. What's the first thing he asked of her? Did he say, woman, are you, are you married? Why are you touching me? No, he didn't say that. Did, did he say, are you divorced? What, what's your past like? You're, you're seeking power from me and did he start to point out her struggles, her faults? Uh, I'm guessing she has a story just like each and every one of us. And I'm guessing after 12 years of bleeding, she had probably done a lot of things during those 12 years that she may regret. She may have tried these ointments, these drinks, these, all these things to heal her body. And she found no relief. Yet when Jesus had the opportunity to be there, he didn't ask her her age. He didn't ask her her race or her political views or her preferences. He wasn't concerned with those things. In Mark chapter 5, verse 34, he just said, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. You, You see, in that moment, Jesus knew there was something greater than being concerned with her past. Jesus knew that there was something greater because in in that moment he recognized that not only was she going to be healed, but we'll see in just a moment that she had spiritual healing as well. You know, there's a a series out called The Chosen. I think some of you have seen some of it. And uh, as I was preparing for this message, one of my favorite parts of The Chosen is is this depiction of the woman with the issue of bleeding that comes through. And uh, it's longer than what we're going to watch Uh, But we're going to watch a few minutes so you can see a picture of what this looked like. So uh, check this out. are pressing in all around you like this and you're asking who touched you? They all have. Someone touched me. I felt that power went out of me. Whoever touched me, 
Come forward, teacher. It was me. Just the fringe of your garment, only the edge, I promise. You are not unclean. Why my garment? I'm sorry. I, I know I should have asked. But if, if you touched me, it would make you ritually unclean according to the law. I, I was sick. I was sick for 12 years. I bled and, and, and no one could stop it. But, but I believed if I could just touch a piece of your garment. <laughs> I was right. I was right. Thank you. Who told you I could heal? A man from the pool. And he was right. The blood is ceased. My daughter. I'm no one's daughter anymore. Look up. Yes, you are. Daughter. It wasn't my piece of clothing that healed you. But it was instant. I felt it right away. I know. But it wasn't this. It was your faith. Teacher, she was bleeding so long, we can take her. She is clean. <laughs> you have blessed me today. And I know. My daughter, I know it has been a fight for you for so long. You must be exhausted. Go now in peace. Your faith has made you well. I wish I could stay here longer. But I have business to attend to. Someone else has faith like yours. I'm so glad that we found each other. So you see, it wasn't about Jesus' garment. It wasn't about anything other than her faith. Because Jesus recognized that it was her faith. Now this is just a depiction or people acting it out. But I think it's so powerful to note that he, that he says in, in Scripture that it was because of her faith. There's power in your faith. So many times as Christians, we think that the power is from God, and, and we're right. The power comes from God. But God gives us the power, and because of our faith, we, we can make things happen. God can use us in powerful ways, and, and healing can happen in this world. You see, in this scripture, it wasn't about her sin. Jesus healed her because he loves her, and he decided it was her time to be healed. He decided that it was her time to be healed. Now, you may ask the question, how did he decide it was her time to be healed while somebody else was dying? Because you know about uh, Jairus' daughter who was dying at that time. How did he decide which was best? I don't have an answer to that. I'm not Jesus. But, but the thing is, Jesus knew what the best thing to do was. You, you see, the word used to describe the healing that took place here is the same word that can be translated saved. When he said that she was healed, it can also be translated that she was saved. And that's an important thing to note. Some would suggest that this woman had spiritual healing in this moment as well. Now, now once again, we don't know her past. We don't know what struggles she's had. But Jesus is basically saying to this woman, you have a new beginning. You're my daughter. And I think it's important to note that he used that word, daughter. Because in Scripture, in the New Testament, we don't read Jesus using that word a lot. We, we don't read Jesus saying to people, you are my daughter. 
He talks about people becoming sons and daughters of the Father, but he wants her to know that because of her faith, they have an intimate relationship together like a father and a daughter. And that's very important to note that she's come into that relationship with him because of her faith. You know, when we have doubts in the world, when in doubt, we need to have faith. When things are good, we need to have faith. Really, we just simply need to have faith. Faith in our lives can change everything. Faith can be a, a stumbling block for, for non-believers because they don't know if they can have faith. Uh, but for those of us that are followers of Christ, it is the basis of what we live by. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 35, uh, it says this, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing that, they said, overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. So in this scripture, we, we read about what took place during the the woman's healing. We, we read that during the time that, that Jesus was healing the woman with the issue of bleeding, Jairus' daughter apparently died. And uh, she was a 12-year-old girl. And uh, this, this had to be a challenge for Jairus. And Jairus had to be like, why did we stop? Uh, I know as a father, that's where I would be. I'd be like, why was she more important than my daughter? But in this moment, in this moment, um, Jesus told them, don't be afraid, just believe. He didn't say in that moment, she's not dead. He didn't say in that moment, I'm going to bring her back to life. He said, just believe. Basically, no matter what's going on, the good or the bad or the difficult situation, believe, have faith, trust that I am who I say I am. Having faith is easy when things are going well. For, for me, when things are all falling in line and everything's going great, having faith is easy. Next Sunday, when uh, Easter comes around and I get to spend time with family and everything goes smoothly through the church service on Sunday morning and, and we gather with family for a meal and everything's going well, having faith is easy in that moment for me. Because it just feels like it's a God-ordained moment when we celebrate things like Easter. It's an opportunity for us to be filled with his love. But having faith may be considered challenging when things aren't going well. You know, think of the times when somebody's sick and you're scared they may pass away. Think of the times when somebody gets hurt and you're like, oh no, what's going on? Do, do we still have the same faith in Jesus that we do when things are going good? That's, that's the question. Our faith should remain the same no matter what the situation is. No matter what's going on, our faith should remain the same. No matter what we're dealing with. You see, the people in, cr in the crowd were changed that day because of this woman's faith. Did you think about that in the video? It wasn't just the woman whose life was changed in that moment when she was healed, when she had so much faith that she reached out and just touched his garment. Everyone around there were witnesses to that moment as well. Sometimes we lose sight of the impact our faith can have. Be because, you know, she had her life changed. She no longer had this issue. She, she was healed from this moment on, and she had a relationship with Jesus. She understood who he was. But all the other people saw what took place. And I'm sure they shared with those around them, hey, this is what I saw today. This is who Jesus was. This is what Jesus can do. And he said it was because of her faith. So what do you think they all thought they should do? Have faith. Have faith. And if we have faith, Jesus can do the impossible. You see, faith is so important because it's all we can do to play a part in being saved. That's it. You gotta understand, when you come and, and you make a declaration that I believe Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, and you truly have faith that you believe that's true, that's all you got. You can't walk yourself into that baptistry, dunk yourself under the water, and come back up and be like, 
ah, I got it. No, it's all up to Jesus. All we can do is have faith. My life changed many, many years ago because I realized all I can have is faith. If I have faith in Jesus and I live my life for him, he'll take care of the rest. You know, there's been days that I haven't had a lot of money. And there's been days that I've been blessed. And, and there's days that I've, I've struggled with my health. And there's days that I've been really healthy. There's been lots of up and downs in my faith journey. Uh, there's been days I've loved going to work. And there's days that I've not loved going to work. But my faith remained the same. Because Jesus never changed in those moments. Jesus never changed. Excuse me. Um, Jesus never changed in the mo those moments. Jesus was concerned with physical health too, though. And this is important to note. I love what it says in Luke 8.55 about, about this scripture. It says, Her spirit returned to her, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them, give her something to eat. This is Jairus' daughter. We read earlier about when Jairus' daughter was there. When, when Jesus went to Jairus' daughter, and there was people wailing and playing flutes. As I was studying for this, I found out that they were required to hire people to mourn the death of their daughter. That's the weirdest thing I've ever heard of, just so you know. If somebody in my family dies, I don't think I need to hire somebody else to be sad about it. But that's what they were to do. And these people came in and they were wailing and they were being loud and crying. And, and there was people playing flutes. And uh, Jesus came up and he's like, what are y'all doing? And basically like, what's going on here? And they're like, well, she's dead. And he says, nah, she's just asleep. These people who were hired laughed in his face. They laughed in his face. But, but Jesus said, go away, go away. Let's, let's go in. So him, the disciples, and Jairus and his wife went in, and he told her to get up. Get up. And this 12-year-old girl rises up and walks. No problems, no nothing. But it's important to note what he said there. And in Luke 8.55, he said, Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. That's almost like comical to me which I think Jesus is pretty funny sometimes. I don't know if you know this, but God has a sense of humor. He made you. So uh, the thing about it is, we recognize that Jesus is in this moment, and he cares not just about the fact that Jairus' daughter was healed, but he also says, give her something to eat. You know, physically, she probably hadn't ate for days. Give her some food. Let her belly feel full. Let her, let her feel energy. Let her feel the joy of this world. You see, faith changes everything because Jairus had faith that Jesus could heal. Even when Jairus was told that his daughter had passed, Jesus said, ah, just believe. Just believe. Don't let this change anything. Whether it's good times or bad times, don't let this change anything. Just have faith. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we're going we're gonna to read a scripture that I, that I love because it's about our faith in Jesus Christ. It's about the impact of our faith and the grace that Jesus offers. In Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that, so that no one can boast. You know, faith is an important part of our relationship with Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. That faith is the part you have. You have to have faith. And then it is by his grace that we can be saved. You know, this is what we want for others as well. As we talk about other people, we want them to come and to have faith. We want them to come and get to know Jesus and have faith and believe in him. And Jesus says right here in Scripture, just believe. He tells Jairus, just believe. He tells the woman, woman, you've been healed because of your faith. 
It's, it's simple. I, I don't want to overcomplicate anything. I want us to understand that coming to have faith and believing in Jesus is simple. But sometimes we make it complicated because we think, oh, if she's going to come, she needs to stop doing this before she comes. You know, I want to invite my friend to church. But I know what they did this weekend. And I don't really think they should be coming to church. Just so you know you're wrong, if you believe that. I don't care what situation somebody's in. You're not going to change someone. I'm not going to change someone. When they come to know Jesus and they have faith in him, faith like this woman that reached out to touch Jesus' garment, that's when their life is going to change. And it may not look the way I want it to look. It may not look the way you want it to look. Things may not go exactly the way we think they should. But in Jesus' time, he'll do what needs to be done. Because he is perfect. You know, so many times in my life, I've stood at the front of a room like this, and we've offered it an invitation time. And uh, for many years, I worked with junior high students. And as I worked with junior high students, I'd stand in the front, and, and we'd have play a song or let them come forwards to make a decision for Jesus. And student after student came up and said, I want to talk to you. I'm like, awesome, let's talk. This is the most exciting time for me when a student wanted to talk about Jesus. But they would come up, and over and over again, I heard the same thing. I'm not good enough to become a Christian. I'm not good enough to be healed by God. I'm not good enough. I got news for you. I'm not good enough. And I've received the gift from Jesus Christ. And I, and I encourage you to know that if you have a sin in your life, if you have a struggle you're dealing with, come forwards and ask for prayer for God to heal you. Because God can and will heal. If you're at a point in time in your life that you haven't decided to follow Jesus, you haven't been immersed in the water, and you're like, I just haven't felt like I'm there yet. I haven't felt like I'm good enough. Let me tell you, Jesus isn't waiting for you to be good enough. Jesus wants to transform your life because you have faith in him. I want to encourage you this morning as we sing. I'm going to say a word of prayer, and after I do, we're going to sing together. But if you want to come forwards for prayer, you can do that. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for each person in this room and the opportunity we have to worship and praise you. God, I thank you for this, this passage of Scripture where we see such great faith where the woman believed that even though she wasn't supposed to be in that situation, she could just reach out and touch your garment. God, I wish I could live my life that way to know that just being in your presence changes everything. God, I thank you for the example she set. And God, for the example of Jairus and his family as, as they had faith even when they were seeing good take place, yet they were hearing about the loss of their daughter. The powerful words of Jesus to say, just believe. I pray that we can live that out in our lives. God, I pray that we can share that love with our community so that they can come to know you and have faith in you. Be with us now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you... My 
together in prayer this morning. God, we thank you for this morning, this time that we've got to spend together as a body of believers, um, worshiping you and hearing a teaching from your word. I pray that you'd be with us as we go throughout the rest of this week, um, as we prepare our hearts for Good Friday and for Resurrection Sunday. I play, pray that you would constantly um, bring us, bring our hearts closer to you. And I pray that we would draw closer to you through everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.